disturbance like that. Cool. I think you need to press continue, Jess. Now I'm in on the Zoom thing. <laughs> I think you need to do that on your screen. Everyone's got an individual one on their screen. All right, cool. Um, so can you go back to the other slide, sorry. Um, so just to uh, introduce all of us, so I'm Madeline Levy, I'm on an internship with Open Data for the next eight weeks and I'm also a final year occupational therapy student, which is why I think I've got the credibility to talk about some of these issues. And I'm also a person who has lived experience of um, conditions. I have Asperger's, uh, dyspraxia, depression and general anxiety uh, disorder. And um, my colleague Esme will introduce us at all. Hiya. Hi, Esme. Do you want to unmute, Esme? Hello? Can you hear me now? My internet's gone a bit laggy, so I wasn't quite sure what was happening then. Um, I'm Esme. I manage a care team um, around a lovely guy um, called Isaac, who you will probably know in some way shape or form because most people in Birmingham do um, and I am really passionate and interested in mental health for people with complex needs. Um, Thank you. I'm going to have Hazel speak after this as well aren't we on um, how language is used uh, in disability rights. Do you want to say hi Hazel? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the lag is unbelievable. Yeah, um, I'm Hazel, you've already met me, but um, I'm, I'm writing my dissertation, which is all about language use in uh, different disabled rights communities. So I thought I'd present about that today. Next slide, please, Jess. So um, here the, are the aims and intentions for the session. And as you can see, they're quite big aims. So please don't be, um, put off or freaked out by um, the density of it. I think that's reflective of the density of the types of models that we're working with. Um, but the aims are to understand the social and political context behind the work of open theater, to become acquainted with the medical and social models of disability, to understand how the models link with open theater's practice, to understand the importance of the way we use language and how language is linked to the two models and to understand the impact of COVID-19 on people with learning and additional needs and how open theatre can continue to support those individuals. And if you have any questions throughout the pre presentation, please feel free to post them in the chat and I'll try and um, respond to them at the end of the presentation, I think is the best way to do this. Um, Next slide, please, Jess. So um, we'll start with the medical model of disability. Uh, in 1851, the first English school for children with physical disabilities was established in London, Marlebone. Um, in 1893, the Elementary Education for Blind and Deaf Children Act was passed. And that was the first piece of legislation surrounding um, children with any sort of needs and uh, the first physical um, deficit definition shortly followed that and I'll give you a few minutes to read that. If someone could put a thumbs up when they finished reading it then that would be good. So um, as you can see from that, it's a pretty broad definition. 
and it's basically anything that disrupts the child's school routine or um, was seen as different was basically viewed as some a deficit or a defect. Um, so that shows us how non-individualistic it was and how um, generalised a definition uh, that was. Um, and in 1899, the Elementary Education for Defective and Epileptic Children Act was passed. And I want you to uh, pay close attention to the language there because it's very um, medically driven. It's quite negative. And um, the reason I'm choosing to continue to use that language there is because that was the language of the time. That's not the language that is correct or um present now and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, next slide please Jess. So um, to continue on with the timeline for the medical model of disability, um, in 1980 the World Health Organization who we fondly know as occupational therapists as WHO um, introduced a framework for working with disability um, publishing the International Classification of Impairments, Disabilities and Handicaps Framework. And the framework proposed to approach disability by using the terms impairment, handicap and disability. And again, I'll give you a few minutes to read each definition there. And again, if somebody would like to let me know when they've finished reading the definitions. Cool. And so this framework became the basis for the medical model of disability. And I've deliberately made this presentation quite um, dense and wordy because that's reflective of how the medical model is and how inaccessible. It actually is for um, lots of people. And these are the people that get spoken about by medical professionals who are not able to engage with or access this type of um, wording or language. Next slide, please. So what actually is the medical model then? What is the beliefs and values that underpin this model? Well, it views individuals as suffering or impaired by their condition. It views disabilities as needing to be fixed, treated or cured. And medical professionals interpret narratives about disabilities or impairments from patients to form a diagnosis. The diagnosis will be linked to biological causes. It places emphasis on the individual to get better or improve and, it, and society does not have to intervene or make spaces more accessible for individuals. And as you can see in the picture there, a whole host of health professionals um, get involved to support the individual um, and the onus is on the individual to manage their impairment or problem. And I've now got a bit of a YouTube video which will hopefully um, give you a break from wording on the screen and explain this in a bit more uh, of an accessible way. This video provides an overview of the two models of disability. These models provide a basis for defining disability and assess how society and the individual play a role in resolving the impairment associated with the disability. The two major models of disability include the medical model and the social model. Now let's explore each model in more detail. The medical model attempts to remedy disability impairment by means of medical cures and medical intervention. In this case, the individual is viewed as the object of impairment due to their disability. 
The solution is to try to remedy the impairment to make the individual seem more normal in the eyes of society. In this model, society does not have a role in making accommodations for the individual. Rather, it is solely up to the individual to work around society to manage their impairment. So what are the issues with this model and how do they relate to education? The medical model views disability as a curable impairment that needs to be corrected within the individual. Unfortunately, not all disabilities can be fully corrected with medical intervention. Some disabilities can be improved with med medicine and therapy, but they don't dissolve the impairment completely. Society lacks responsibility within this model. In other words, it's up to the individual to work around limitations and barriers that prevent accessibility. For instance, a staircase without a ramp limits access to a person in a wheelchair. In this model, the individuals are often isolated as a result of their disability. They are sent to specialized schools that separate them from others, which limits their ability to be integrated and accepted into society. In the social model, disability is looked at in terms of the interaction between the individual and society. In this case, impairment needs to be addressed by societal change to ensure that those with a disability can have equal and adequate access. This model focuses on the actual needs of the person and does not view the individual as the problem. Now, let's take a closer look at how this model interacts with aspects of education. In this case, the social model seeks to improve accommodation and accessibility standards for the individual. This includes things like adding ramps and elevators to buildings, adding braille signs to internal environments, and providing video, captioning, and audio guides, just to name a few examples. In the social model, the individual is integrated into society as a normal person. Individuals should be treated in an equal manner and thus should be allowed to attend schools with other individuals to allow them to become part of society. The social model provides a more humanized approach to disability and provides more respect to the individual in terms of providing accommodations and accessibility. Hello, welcome to the second lecture in the series on social inclusion. I think you need to, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, can I have the next slide, please, Jess? So hopefully um, that gave you a break from listening to my voice for a while, but it also uh, gave you a better um, understanding of the uh, way the two models work within affecting society's viewpoints of um, individuals with conditions. Um, there are critiques of the medical model, which is that not everyone can articulate or knows how their disability affects them. Uh, it removes responsibility of others to adapt the environment for individuals with physical or mental health needs. And the medical language that's used can further isolate individuals as it's not understood by all of the individuals who have conditions and it can make them feel othered by society. Um, for example, the word retarded derives from the medical model and it means slow to progress or a delay in mental development However, it's now become an unpleasant societal slur due, uh, to describe people with learning or additional needs. And the medical model is not inclusive of everyone as it mainly deals with cause and effect type language. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, so like as we, Richard was saying about honesty and um, discussion of like how these models actually affect people. I thought I'd um, tell you a bit about my own lived experience. Um, I'm 31 years old and I have Asperger's syndrome. Uh, I was introduced to the medical model at a young age without realizing it because I had many assessments with different health professionals, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, and not once did they tell me what those assessments were for and that was really um, frustrating and aggravating for me as a child who always wanted to know the answers to things and always wanted to know um, why things were the way they were in the world um, and as a result that led me to train to become a health professional myself um, and I'm in my final year of no tea degree because I want to change the system and introduce individualized care planning uh, for people with learning needs. Well, 
not just people with learning needs actually for all children i think all children should have individualized care planning in school um whether they're uh disabled or not um there's currently no support available for adults with learning or additional needs apart from pip and that very much uses medical model language as it expects individuals to be able to articulate how their disability affects them um and we come across this a lot in open theatre where um, we're trying to support people with PIP and you have to do the, well, because of my um, depression, X or Y happens, and then they score um, your answers and that's how the money is awarded. Um, and the process of applying for PIP is often very long and it's often traumatic for people with health conditions because they have to describe their worst possible day and there's a lot of societal shame already that's involved around having conditions so having to openly discuss that with somebody that you've never met before who's often late to your appointment um, can be quite a traumatic process um, and the process of getting a diagnosis as an adult is also very long and it requires lots of um, evidence which individuals have to collect themselves, not always from people who they might have positive relationships with because you need to collect evidence from parents and teachers, etc. cetera. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite challenging being asked all the time um, how your needs, uh, affect you even though we need to be asking those questions to people because otherwise what else is left there'd just be silence and um, those questions wouldn't be asked or talked about next slide please jess um so i guess like i don't want to jump on the covid19 bandwagon too much but it is really important to um talk about the current political climate and context and how um that's impacted people directly who have learning and additional needs so um i thought the best way to do this would be to uh talk to you honestly about my experience um so my employment ceased in march 2020 due to needing to shield because of my asthma and working in a care home um, I had no support from the government uh, financially or otherwise as I was on a zero hours contract and Hazel actually supported me to um, access benefits, which was quite a difficult process. Um, my mental health was badly affected due to the constant changes in my uh, daily routine and the constant changes in uh, the political climate that was happening daily at the time. Um, I got COVID-19 myself in March 2020 and um, it hit me quite badly. So I had to manage that alongside my uh, existing health conditions. And I couldn't finish my degree course because there was a shortage in practice placements in the NHS um, because there were no staff available to assess competencies because they were all obviously fighting and supporting COVID, uh, fighting COVID and supporting patients with COVID. They weren't fighting the patients with COVID, sorry. Um, so I'm currently awaiting a final placement in September 2021. Uh, next slide, please, Jess. But I don't want to focus on the negative side of things because the medical model often focuses a lot on deficits and negatives, but I like to focus on um, strengths that people have and challenges rather than deficits and negatives. So um, it's not all been bad for me. I got out of debt due to not having to go anywhere, so I wasn't needing to spend any money. Um, I gained a better understanding of how to manage my own mental health and uh, my physical health as well. I became closer to friends uh, and loved ones. 
I got better at cooking, photography, singing and acting because I had loads more time to engage in my hobbies. Um, I managed to work on publishing my own book um, with Alex Manners, who actually encouraged me to uh, finish it. So uh, his support was really invaluable. And um, that's coming out in September. And it's about how to survive the education system with Asperger's and how educators can better support individuals. Um, and I got a new placement at Open Theatre Company for summer 2021, which I am really, really enjoying um, at the moment. So next slide, please. And how this links to Open Theatre's practice, what's this got to do with all of you guys? So um, Open Theatre work with young people with a variety of needs. You don't always know how their conditions impact them at home. You only see a small snapshot of their daily lives. You don't know how they feel about their condition and you don't know how they would prefer their condition to be described. It's important that as a company, we role model best practice and ask people how they want to be described, how they feel about their condition and how they identify as an artist and a person generally. It's a move towards using a more social model of disability and also the human rights model of disability within your practice. And using positive language to describe individuals and artists, which is guided by those individuals themselves. And I've got some provocations for you guys um, there, uh, which is how do we do this when people are nonverbal? How do we ensure that we are advocating for people on their behalf rather than just speaking over them? And that was a question that Richard asked in his um, intent at the start of the session. Um, so if Jess is OK, I'd like for everyone to go into breakout rooms for how many minutes, Jess, do you reckon? Well, I suppose we've got another half an hour of this slot so it depends um how you want to balance that out with esme and hazel what hazel's doing a face you probably know better than me what do you think five minutes then five minutes judging my hazel space so um <laughs> okay i'm gonna stop so if we <laughs> Welcome back. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the social model of disability now. I know you heard a bit um, in that video that Maddie shared. Um, but first, I just want to do a bit of a disclaimer. I'm using the terminology disabled people, but like completely acknowledge that, you know, we all still have the right to identify however is most comfortable to us. This is just the most um, fitting term for this presentation because it's the terminology that the social model uses. Um, so the social model was founded by disabled people um, from the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation. Um, this guy here, this is Mike Oliver, um, who was a professor of disability studies. Um, and he is the person who is responsible for naming and popularizing um, the social model of disability. Um, and the biggest thing about the social model of disability is that it argues that um, it's not the impairments themselves that are the main cause of social exclusion. It's actually the how society responds to disabled people. Um, and so this is kind of fighting against the assumption that disabled people view their impairments as deficits or anything that needs to be fixed about them. Um, and that the onus should be more on society adapting um, to fit around people with differing needs. Um, so next slide, please, Jess. Um, so this model is really about um, the barriers that disabled people face um, in society. Um, and this covers physical accessibility. Um, so that's things like ramps, um, 
accessible changing spaces, um, all of that stuff, which we're all quite familiar with. Um, communication accessibility, um, so that's like braille um, sign and stuff. Um, what comes to mind is uh, the news announcements about COVID that weren't, weren't signed um, in any way. Um, but it's not just limited to that, it's also about the kind of exclusionary attitudes um, that people can have about people with disabilities. Um, sort of the, the thing that gets me the most that I come across the most is a kind of really patronizing talking down to attitude, um, which is really unhelpful. Um, so this rests on um, two definitions like the medical model does, um, but I'll give you a few minutes to read that um, and see what you think. Someone give me a thumbs up when you've read it. Cool. Um, so what you'll see there is um, that the actual definition of disability here is not the impairment, it's society's reaction to the impairment. That's what's disabling. Um, next slide, please, Jess. Um, so there are a couple of critiques on the social model. Um, a big one is that quite a few disabled people um, with profound medical needs um, feel like this doesn't quite capture the nuance of feeling frustrated and um, like it's not just society that is isolating them. They, they find their actual impairments isolating as well um, and they want that to be included in the conversation. Um, Another big one is that uh, this model is quite often used as kind of like a tokenistic thing in organisations um, as like a change of outlook on disability, but it's not properly, thoroughly applied and integrated into practices. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons uh, for this, because the social model demands a wider social change. Um, and obviously, that's something that we're all pushing for and really want, but in the current political climate, we're quite far from achieving that. Um, and so many care settings and schools are, are just not in a position with the resources where they can actually apply the social model through practice. Um, it's written in a lot of procedural stuff, but when you don't have the staffing and the funding, then you can't be person-led and person-centered and adapt the way that you need to. Um, so next slide, please, Jess. So how does this all apply to you guys? Um, I think it's really important um, for you to have an understanding of the kind of social barriers, um, the people that you work with um, and sort of how these might impact uh, the people that you work with um, on their confidence, their mental health, and even sometimes their ability to engage with you. Um, I, what you do is, is in a big way, social model put into practice. Um, it's kind of so important to create these spaces where disabled people set the pace and have agency over their experience um, and are treated as creative collaborators um, and kind of that creative adaptation um, to fit in with, with the needs of different individuals um, and sharing in experiences together. Um, I think a big thing is acknowledging the abilities and insights of disabled people. Um, and yeah, providing spaces where they can express themselves and engage meaningfully is really important. Um, I think something that we're going to explore more with Hazel, um, but considering the language you use to talk about nonverbal uh, people when you engage in a nonverbal practice as well is quite a nuanced and complex things, as I'm sure we were all talking about in the breakout rooms. Um, next slide, please, Jess. Um, so just to help you kind of put it into context, I'm going to talk a bit about my experience as a carer um, to try and highlight how these models kind of come across as like very clear cut separate things, but actually how they interact in real life is a bit more nuanced and a bit less um, easy. <laughs> 
Um, so as I said before, we work with Isaac um, and we put a lot into making, making the community around him an incredibly supportive one that values him um, and that his, he has agency over his own life um, and experiences. Um, it's really important to us. Um, but we do come up against the medical model a lot. Um, he has a lot of medical needs. Um, and I think it's it's important that you can engage with the medical model when you need to, um, like Maddie was saying before. Um, there's actually, I've linked here, um, PMLD Link have created an amazing guide um, for healthcare professionals that I've found useful in just how to talk to healthcare professionals about people with complex needs. Um, so <laughs> put that everywhere you can because I just think it's so useful. Um, and like I was talking about before, um, settings really struggle to implement the social model and we're kind of trying to um, acknowledge that Isaac might one day end up in a setting and we really want for him to be able to get his needs met. And that's really hard because that's fighting against that thing that's like we don't want to put the onus on him but in some ways it has to be because of the society that he's in. Um, so we're really trying to get um, communication development up there, but that, that comes to this bigger issue that is, we can create these safe spaces and these bubbles for people, um, but there is a wider issue. And that is that wider society is not an accepting or safe space for disabled people. Um, that's kind of why disability justice is so important. Uh, next slide, Jess. So do we have time for a five minute break for reflection here or? Well, I didn't even start. Slide. Um, my instinct is not to go completely full screen because I'm just convinced that it will break my computer again. So I hope that this kind of um, that this this scale is workable before they go. It's almost full screen, right? Um, so this is just going to be talking about language and how language is used by different groups. We've heard a little bit about how. Um, Somebody's posted in chat. I shouldn't be looking at chat. Why would I be looking at chat? No, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Um, I just need to not do that. Um, yeah. Um, so this is called My Resistance is More Inclusive Than Yours. You can maybe feel a little bit in that as well. There's like some kind of like, it's a little bit as well about the relationships between the different disabled rights groups and how some barriers to that kind of cross disability solidarity kind of came up and stuff. What's all this then? Um, basically disability is super duper complicated. Nobody's sure what counts or what disability is or means. And there are lots of different political movements pushing for change, but their language and behaviors are very different. Uh, this kind of has been covered um, by Maddie and Esme and at the start as well. So kind of talk about the beginnings of the social model in kind of the, 20, the 20s the 70s and the 80s, we talked about um, this being kind of the time where particularly people with learning disabilities were kind of um, being reintroduced into um, community settings and having their needs met by support workers and, and carers and assistants in their own homes rather than um, being in hospitals. Um, we've talked about this as well. So this is again kind of um, Mike Oliver writing about um, the social and individual models of disability. Um, and and as you can tell, it's been quite important. It was an important idea, particularly for uh, uh, disabled people with physical impairments, kind of arguing for societal change, for ramps, for equal access to opportunities and everything else. Um, but as was already coming up in some of those breakout conversations, there are some problems and some limitations to that, particularly around its accessibility for people with learning uh, differences and disabilities. So, like a lot of social change movements, uh, the disabled rights movement didn't start particularly inclusive. Um, lots of people involved in the 
early days kind of had goals of um, fitting in with non-disabled societies and kind of minimizing the importance of differences. Um, and I ended up excluding a lot of people with learning disabilities and differences, excluded a lot of people with psychiatric conditions and included a lot of people with complex needs. Um, I'd say that the quite central to the argument of um, like what mainstream disabled rights movement was doing at the time was around kind of um, uh, like, I'm not different to normal people in the way that I think and the way that I experience myself and my world. It's just my, my body that's different and you need to adapt to my body. So just any kind of tension or nuance around kind of like, well, there, there are disabled people who um, do experience the world in a very different way to non-disabled people was kind of a little bit threatening to that to that kind of early just kind of like we've got to fight this fight and win this fight first and then we'll be inclusive afterwards so what did that end up meaning it meant that um lots of different groups of like other disabled people ended up having their own activism so people with learning disabilities were doing their own thing and um, so in 1984 uh, people first is set up and this is a group of people with learning disabilities supporting each other to be self-advocates and their language even then is very different to the mainstream disabled rights movement. Their name is literally people first rather than disability first. So members at the time described themselves as people with learning difficulties, described themselves as people with learning disabilities yet, and they didn't describe themselves as learning disabled people either. So that was kind of flipped from how mainstream disabled rights was kind of talking. Um, They've been around now for four decades. So people first groups are now all over the country um, and their purpose has changed during that time as well. So some are still kind of supportive self-help groups. They're about adults with learning disabilities and differences, helping each other, supporting each other to be self-advocates. Some are more formal advocacy organizations now. They're involved in healthcare consultations, they're involved in giving evidence um, as part of legal proceedings. Um, and they're responsible for a large number of legal victories for the rights of people with learning disabilities. They're responsible for popularizing the easy read format. That's been kind of a big campaign that People First has pushed. And they're responsible for changing a lot of NHS policies and procedures. Um, generally for, I feel like People First as a, as a group, very hard to generalize, um, but, um, language has been less of a concern for um, people with learning disabilities and the organizations led by them than it has been for um, autistic or autism and neurodivergent communities for reasons that might be obvious and we'll also get into a little bit later. However, people first have changed the language that they use over time. So now very frequently in their kind of literature, they say people with learning dif differences slash disabilities and autism or autistic people. And that's kind of their standard way of describing the, their membership. So, Mad Pride. So this is, um, again, so um, I talked a little bit briefly at the start about kind of um, learning disability and mental health kind of weren't separated very much in kind of NHS context. So struggles towards equality and rights for those two groups of people are quite strongly intertwined. Um, so Mad Pride events. So these were public protests and marches held by survivors of psychiatric institutions. Again, that's the language they choose to use, survivors of psychiatric institutions and their allies. And the first one is held in London in 1993, some happening in Canada in the same year. Uh, the events mostly stopped happening kind of the mid 2000s, but there's still a sizable community who choose to self-identify with the terms mad or politically mad. Again, it's kind of informed by the social model. So mad pride activists emphasize how the idea of madness is to some extent like disability made up. It's a difference in functioning and the fact that society isn't equipped to deal with it is what makes some people mad compared to other non-mad people. They point to how people with learning disability are no longer housed in long stay hospitals, but their large number of people with psychiatric conditions or disabilities, A, are still labeled as dangerous, and they still, some of them still spend the majority of their lives in segregated, not seriated, segregated hospitals and institutions. Most activists who were active in the 90s and early 2000s feel that psychiatric care has changed and improved, but more could and should still be done. 
but the pride events themselves tend to happen less now. Possibly just because some of the organizers are kind of less, less involved, but the movement is still there. And now we're kind of coming to um, autism specifically um, as, as a community um, that was starting to recognize itself as being different from broader disability or learning disability, just kind of on its own terms, becoming a community and finding its own language to describe itself, which is going to get really complicated. So um, this was an important essay written in 1993 called Don't Mourn For Us. This was written by Jimson and Claire, published in an international newsletter called Our Voice. And it's an emotional piece directed towards the non-autistic parents of autistic children. Again, it's the language I've picked because it's the language he uses in the essay. Um, the language and ideas in it are kind of considered the starting point for the neurodiversity movement and for um, autistic self-advocacy movements as well. Um, and somehow I forgot to put this, identity first language, kind of this is where that kind of starts happening. So this is people choosing to describe themselves as autistic people, people with autism, or even people on the spectrum. Um, and there's just a passage in it that I want to read in full just because I think it articulates very clearly why um, Jim and some other um, autistic people or people with autism kind of choose and prefer that language. Um, so what did Jim write? Jim wrote, autism is not an appendage. Autism isn't something a person has or a shell that a person is trapped inside. There's no normal child hidden behind the autism. Autism a way of being, it is pervasive. It colors every experience, every sensation, perception, thought, emotion, and encounter, every aspect of existence. It's not possible to separate the autism from the person. And if it were possible, the person you'd have left would not be the same person you started with. This is important, so take a moment to consider it. Autism is a way of being. It is not possible to separate the person from the autism. Therefore, when parents say, I wish my child did not have autism. What they're really saying is, I wish the autistic child did not exist and I had a different non-autistic child instead. Read that again. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence. This is what we hear when you pray for a cure. This is what we know when you tell us of your fondest hopes and dreams for us, that your greatest wish is that one day we will cease to be and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. Very, very emotional essay. Um, read it if you have time and you feel like you have the emotional space to read the whole thing. Um, but that kind of language was kind of what kind of sparked identity first language being uh, such a thing, particularly in the online um, autism or autistic community. I think there is a quite a big distinction between people who are very active in those online spaces and um, kind of other, um, uh, adults on the spectrum who are less active in those communities and I think there is a big difference in how those two communities identify and describe themselves. Um, I'm going to look briefly at the chat. Beautiful and devastating. Yeah, wanted to check that nobody was saying I can't believe you. <laughs> cool. So this brings us on to online autism communities. So uh, as I've said, more than other communities we've talked about, language has been a particularly important battleground for online autistic and autism communities. Again, I don't necessarily think that this is everyone um, with autism or who identifies as autistic, but particularly online, there's been quite a fierce kind of battle of ideas that's been kind of raging over what language should be used. Person first language, which is what we would say people um, has unfortunately been co-opted and used by groups such as Autism Speaks, which seeks to cure autism, but otherwise minimize its noticeability through harmful therapies like ABA, which stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis. I would love to talk more about what that is, but we do not have time in this one. So many online activists and community spaces will be angry if you use person-first language and will insist on identity-first language. And you might also see some anger towards phrases like autism mum or autism parent being used by neurotypical parent, the autistic person. And you might see some or less anger towards the phrase on the spectrum in some of these online spaces. However, something that's quite important again to um, the communities that we're talking about and also to the neurodivergent community as well is um, 
the idea of respecting personal choice of um, individual people, autistic people, people with autism, to describe themselves however they want and however they choose. Um, so, in terms of open theatre and they're likely to encounter these communities and engage with them, it's, it's in our marketing, in our social media, in where we're advertising opportunities. Um, so, again, the language we choose there, we, it's exactly the same as what we already knew. We need to be using the language that um, young people who can tell us what language they prefer, um, we should be using their language of choice. Um, and, and when we're communicating, if we do encounter any of that kind of like, why have you chosen this language? Just having quite a clear rationale that's kind of like, this is the language preferred by the artist, or this is kind of on the whole from the community that we represent, this is what seems to be the language that the majority of people prefer. Check and chat again, just to make sure nothing went really, really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm only going to briefly show this, we're not going to read all of this. Um, so there's a couple of slides at the end here that um, will be shared with everyone. At the end, um, the National Autistic Society ran um, kind of the largest piece of research on what language preferred. And again, it doesn't kind of come up with like, it does here, but like everything's kind of like, oh, there's most popular, but there's no consensus on any of it. Um, but kind of broadly speaking, there's a list of like, here are things that are acceptable to say and is on the autism spectrum, is on there, is autistic, is on there. Um, and there's some stuff that generally feels like fewer people like to use. But again, this is only if we're talking in general terms about um, a whole community or if we haven't heard from that particular individual what language they prefer to be using. That's kind of the overall rule. Use whatever language people prefer to use. And if not, there's some guns there on that. And there's similar stuff around neurodiversity as well um, from Flow Observatorium, who you should also check out. Um, collective of neurodivergent artists. They just ran an Arts Council funded um, survey about barriers to access um, for neurodivergent creatives in the creative industries. I haven't read it yet. I'm very excited to, it got released about three days ago. So oh, that's exciting. And that is the end of my presentation. Ta-da! Um. <laughs>